Let us pray. Creator, our living God, we give you thanks for this evening that you have given us to be together. We thank you for the community of people that have gathered here and the communities they represent. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in the Diocese of Brandon. And we thank you that you are present with us as we gather together online and in your name. We pray for the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit to um, pervade our entire conversation this evening, that we would hear you as we hear Rachel and Chad share with us, that we would be led and guided by your Holy Spirit, and that we would be able to come together with joy, with thanksgiving, and with hope in your name, because you are the source of joy, thanksgiving, and hope. Almighty God, giver of all good gifts, look on your church with grace and guide the minds of those who shall choose a bishop for this diocese, that we may receive a faithful servant who will care for your people and support us in our ministries. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So welcome to you all. Um, I'm so pleased that you were able to join us. Know that um, this, this gathering this evening is going to be recorded and will be made available for those in your parishes or those in your deaneries that weren't able to join us this evening. I'm going to give this a little bit of time over to Father Matt to give us any information that he might have regarding the um, maneuvering of Zoom. It might help if I meet myself first. Um, hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Father Matt Kovisk. I am the Secretary of Synod. If you're a Synod delegate, you will have received a bunch of emails from me already. And don't worry, there's lots more where that came from. Uh, just a few, a, a bit of um, an introduction to Zoom for those of you who are new. Um, this is not the Zoom you're probably used to. Uh, this is uh, what is called a Zoom webinar. And the webinar format allows us to kind of um, uh, just have a few people on screen uh, so that um, it's just easier for the, from the background, for me anyway. Um, so for those of you watching uh, this night that don't have uh, panelist privileges, you'll see in the bottom corner here, or bottom kind of bar here across your screen, you'll see the, the one thing that I want to point you to is that Q&A um, button there. And that's where you can ask questions um, of our two, um, our two candidates. Uh, Archdeacon Kara will get into a little bit more about that in a moment, but that's where you can do that. Uh, it will be moderated by Father Chris Evans, who is up there uh, in the corner. Um, if you want to view uh, the whole, all kind of five of us, uh, you're welcome to do so. Just click over in the corner over there, I think, uh, depending on where you're, there it is, um, view, and you can go to speaker or gallery. Those are kind of two um, options available for you. Um, I think that's a brief overview. I don't, I, I don't think I'm forgetting anything. Um, so welcome. It's good to have you here and, uh, may the Holy Spirit move. Thanks, Father Matt, and thank you for um, navigating the technical stuff. If only we could whisk you up here to the college to help figure out our audio issues. But <laughs> I've just turned up the speakers, and so I'm sure everyone can hear. Um, so it's really exciting to be together. As Father Matt said, we have, as a search committee, prepared some general questions for our two candidates. What we're going to do is I'm going to ask those questions kind of alternating. So Chad first, then Rachel, then the next question, Rachel first, then Chad. And um, just so we have kind of that rhythm going. Um, 
for each question, just so everyone knows, I mean, our candidates know this already, but just so you all know, um, for each question, we want them to try and answer in about three minutes. And um, Reverend Chris Ebbets is going to be timing for us. And so um, when that three minutes is uh, is up, what Chris is going to do is he's going to put up his hand. Chris, do you want to just show how that, oh, hello. And then our candidates will know that um, they have just a, a, you know, 30 seconds or so to kind of wrap up their question. And then Chris will put his hand down again. What a great demonstration. Um, then, then at some point later on in our, um, in our gathering, we want to open it up for you folks who are joining us to ask questions, if you will. Now, the way to do that, as Father Matt mentioned, is to type your question in the Q&A. Chris is going to be monitoring the Q&A section in Zoom, and he is going to ask those questions on behalf of the community. That's just the way this Zoom webinar is set up. And so Chris is going to ask the questions. You can put your name on it or you can ask anonymously. It doesn't really matter. Um, Chris is going to be able to express and summarize questions uh, for our candidates. As I said, um, we will take a short break, just a little stretch break for people um, about halfway through. And, um, and then of course, by 8.30, we'll close together in, in prayer and in the grace as we normally do. So that's kind of the format for our evening. And I'm looking forward to, to you know, hanging out with you all for a little bit this evening. So we thought because um, some of you, of course, many of you attendees and participants will have watched the videos that, that Rachel and, and Chad sent and will have some information um, that you've read about them. But just in case you haven't, we wanted to give them a couple of minutes each to introduce or as the case may be, reintroduce themselves to all of us here gathered. And so I'm going to start with uh, Father Chad. If you would be able to give us a like a two minute kind of introduction, who you are and um, and so just you can unmute yourself and give us that introduction. Thanks, Kara. Um, Chad McCharles, born and raised uh, here in Manitoba, just up the road from where we live here in Nipawa, uh, born and raised in Shoal Lake on a farm. My grandparents farmed cattle and grain. Um, married to my best friend. My idea of heaven, to quote Johnny Cash, is coffee with her in the morning. Um, I am dad to two amazing kids. Jacob is in second year university. Uh, Amy is in grade 12. And dog dad to Mildred and Henrietta. And as Queen Victoria famously said, Dashens are untrainable. And that is our experience. Um, St. Paul's Shoal Lake was very pivotal in my childhood. I was very young when I first felt Call to the priesthood, like around the age of seven. Um, kid you not, my grandmother reminded me of that all throughout uh, until the day she died, that I was that young. And that was very much in part uh, because of my involvement in the parish, where seven generations of my family have been baptized, including my own family, my wife and kids. Um, I vividly remember one Christmas Eve, midnight mass coming to town the Aurora Borealis was like amazing. It was bitterly cold. You pull up to the church, smoke's coming out the chimney, the lights are on, uh, come in, the candles are lit. And that warmth and welcome and that time of worship is something that has shaped my vocation um, throughout my life. Uh, ordained 15 years now, served here in the Diocese of Brandon and Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. Uh, where I met Archdeacon Rachel. Um, some of the highlights of my ministry have been serving multi-point parishes, five point, three point uh, urban parish, rural parishes, um, and now an ecumenical shared ministry between the United Church of Canada and uh, the Anglican Church of Canada. Regional Dean, uh, a couple of times, Executive Secretary to Synod in Nova Scotia, which has a larger membership than General Synod, so that was, yeah, Rachel's nodding she remembers that that big show um so that was quite an experience 
prior to not one, but two Benedictine communities, uh, which I founded, uh, hockey chaplain, legion chaplain, um, lots of good things to be involved with. Some of my passions are connecting with people, um, helping people experience thin spaces, connection with the divine um, indigenous culture, and that is a real conveyor for that, experiencing the divine in my experience. Thank you, Chad. And I guess I should ask you um, before we move on, I, I, t I tend towards the informal, but um, what do you prefer us to address you as this evening? Chad, please. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, though, Kara. Yeah. And um, so over to you, Archdeacon Rachel, and maybe I'll ask you the same question. How would you prefer us to uh, address you this evening? Oh, Rachel's good. <laughs> okay. All right. Rachel's well, good. Yeah. Introduce yourself to us. Thank you. Well, my name is Rachel Parker, and I am currently a priest in the Diocese of Edmonton. And um, I live in Wainwright, which is a small town, and I have um, the rector of Dayspring Ministries, which is a group we brought together a year ago, just over a year ago, of Vermilion, uh, which is also a small town, and Edgerton, which is a village. And at the same time we were pulling that together, uh, I was named the Archdeacon for Rural Ministry, which has had me out visiting other parishes and and checking out the challenges they're having about being small small communities and, and struggling churches, but having an incredible sense of hope and the presence of Christ and the work that they're called to do. So it's been amazing. It has put a lot of kilometers on my car in the last year that we hadn't expected when we bought it, when we moved here. Um, but it's been incredible. I love being out and about. Um, I've been ordained uh, a deacon for 24 years, coming up on my priesting uh, in three weeks. It'll be 24 years ordained in the Diocese of Huron, where I spent most of my growing up years. My dad was a banker, so we moved around a lot. And um, just thinking what Chad said about his call, I didn't feel a, a call to actually ordain ministry until I was in seminary, thinking I liked the idea of studying God. Um, but my mom, we had when I was five years old, we had the first women ordained in our diocese in our parish. They were our students. And from that moment on, my mother consistently reminded me that I could be a priest if I wanted to be. Um, and that was sort of in the background all that time. My husband, I've been married for 18 years. Today is the 19th anniversary of his proposal to me. Um, so it's a good day. Um, he is also an Anglican priest. He's a military chaplain um, heading toward the end of his career. And he brought us to all the places that I have lived in other than the Diocese of Huron. Uh, but it's been a real gift to do that. I have served in um, multi-point parishes and I have served in um, a city parish. Um, and just, I, I love what I do and I love the people. I can't think of much else that I can say that it wasn't either in my bio or things or things that hopefully you'll get to know about me as we talk this evening. So I'll just stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you so much. And even that gives us a picture of, of uh, the, the breadth of your uh, experience. So thank you, uh, Rachel. So we're going to go on to our first question. We wanted to kind of ease you two in into our questions. So we're going to um, start with you, Rachel. Um, if you could preach on any one text, what would it be and why? Um. It, oh, if you'd asked me that a week ago, I would have said Ephesians, that you uh, doing more than we can ask God, doing more than we can ask or imagine. But I had an experience last week of, of going out to a nursing home uh, for an evening ecumenical service, and I completely forgot my Bible and every note I had and everything. And I got there and I, okay, what am I going to do? And I preached about Genesis 1 and the incredible beauty of, of creation and the gift that God gave us as being the part of creation when God said, and this is very good. And just the, 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 the beauty of the relationship that we are chosen. God has said to us, I, I did all of this. I created all of this. And then I created you with whom I will partner and we will be stewards together of this. And I think that that um, since last week, that's been sort of on my mind a lot. And really, I've, I've never, ever preached on Genesis before. <laughs> so it was a great experience to do so. But I think that's it. it for me, it sums it up. The gospel, the, the relationship with Jesus Christ, the fact that Christ was present in the beginning when we were invited to share in this grand relationship. So I think, yeah, Genesis 
one, one, two, two, three, I think would be my, would be my passage. Thank you so much. And I mean, right now at Henry Bud, we're doing a From Adam to Noah course. So we've been kind of in that passage as well. So thank you, Rachel. Uh, same question to you, Chad. If you could preach on any one text of the Bible right now, what would it be and why? Toss up. <clears throat> um, I've always said that we should be preaching in word and deed, Good Friday and everything. Um, but it would have to be Proverbs 31. Uh, she laughs at the days to come. Talks about a strong woman caring for her family um, and through her wisdom and the work of her hands and trust in God is able to laugh at the days to come, even though it isn't all, you know, rainbows and roses. The hard winter snows and the cold comes, but she knows because of her faith and the work of her hands that her family will be provided for. And um, that laughter always reminds me of uh, our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, so many laughs and smiles through good and bad. Um, that is something I admire very much about Indigenous culture. And I see that truth in Proverbs. And there's a, a real treasure for the church in there today, especially as we're feeling like we're depleted and like our purpose has faded and we're anxious about the future and not sure. And yet through trust in God and work of our hands, um, we can laugh at the days to come and have joy because um, we have that faith. Thank you. So we can root ourselves in creation and think into the future. Um, maybe you could do a joint sermon sometime on that. <laughs> Thank you both. So we're going to like, we'll go on to the, our next question, kind of uh, talking a little bit more about some specifics with regard to uh, the work that you have both set your, your names forward to do. So we all know that um, being a bishop, the role of a bishop, is not just like a promotion from a priest. It's an entirely different job in some respects, heavy on administration and teaching, uh, dealing with conflict, responding to crisis and resolving interpersonal issues among the many other things that is required of bishops. And so we're wondering for, um, we'll ask you first, Chad, um, given that, being a bishop is a different type of job. What kind of particular gifts or skills do you bring to that job of, of being a bishop? Thank you, Kara. Um, I would possibly argue that it's a demotion uh, rather than a promotion. Um, but we'll leave that alone for now. Uh, the skills that I have collected over the years uh, because of the experience, varied experiences that I've had in the number of uh, pastoral settings, which I mentioned in my intro, um, are like a treasure chest that I, I bring with me. Um, and to pick out a few of those, most recently bringing together two denominations, um, United and Anglican has been a real undertaking and it's happening throughout the diocese and other parishes as well. Um, and so there is some common knowledge there, uh, but it, it's, it's a lot and you really have to learn to step forward um, with grace and in the way of love and um, navigating um, some of the conflicts that arise and realizing that when those conflicts arise, often, if not always, the source is fear. Am I going to 
lose my identity as an Anglican in this relationship or as a United Church member in this relationship. And when you realize that and through experience that I've had in this the last four years, um, you see through the conflict to the heart of those who are expressing their fear and their concern. Um, and that enables you to come to the table uh, together. And something I've always said is if you are in conflict, if um, you are prejudiced against another, if you are unreconciled, if you are judging, you have not spent enough time together uh, at table, especially either, you know, nourishment or sacramental. Um, but in spending time together and building those bridges, so many conflicts dissipate. Um, and of course, throughout parish ministry, that has been a skill I've honed and used. Um, as um, executive secretary in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, uh, it's a very involved job. And I was the youngest person to ever hold it there. And it was jump in with both feet and by golly, did I learn. Um, and those are skills that I carry forward. Although very different scale here in Brandon, um, those skills um, were learned on a steep curve. Um, organizational skills um, without being micromanaging. Um, I'm very task driven and detail oriented, but believe fully in servant leadership and raising up others um, to live into their vocations. Uh, and so that's that's part of the skill set I would bring. Hmm. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Chad. So, um, of course, the same question to you, Rachel. What are the particular skills or gifts that you would bring to um, the role of bishop? Um, I think that one of the things that um, that I feel would hold me in good stead is my my love of relationships and the recognition that relationships differ from within the context. Um, your relationship with your congregations becomes very intimate and personal. Um, and when you are a bishop or even as an archdeacon, I've found that the relationships I share with people, uh, there is this bit of a step back, which in one way is more difficult because you don't have that intimacy, this the the shorthand conversations where everybody knows what you're talking about at the table. But the sec on the other hand, it gives me an opportunity to be able to observe and and share with people what I'm seeing from a different perspective. And I think sometimes um, for congregations and for deaneries, for the bishop to be able to come in or have someone outside the the sort of the 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 intimate circle to come in and share what they see as truth and what they see as hope and possibilities that maybe when we're right next to them, right in the middle of it, we can't see. I think um, conflict, absolutely, there's conflict everywhere, um, but I'm not scared of conflict and I really do almost encourage it. I don't encourage conflict itself, but when we have conflict or we come to that place where we're kind of butting up against each other is recognizing um, the possibilities because if you have this power to, to butt up against each other, you have two people or two groups who are passionate about something. And if we're in the church, probably we're passionate about Jesus. And if we are, we may just be using language that we're not understanding, or we're coming at it from different contexts that maybe we need to share story and to bring that out. And I love being able to facilitate that. And I love teaching. A lot of what I do as an archdeacon is to go in and we have a, a specific, this is what our plan is. And the plan goes over here for a little while because we realize this is where we need to be. Um, and being able to, to speak about the gospel, to, to have people take their stories and share those stories and sharing them with someone who is there because they want to be there and that they care about them and the outcomes that we are working toward, um, the gospel outcomes, the very practical personal outcomes, and sometimes even the personnel outcomes, like we don't have a priest any longer. Um, what do we do? We're now closed, we're vacant. And no, 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 you're not closed, you're not vacant. You don't have a priest right now, but you have ministry and you have people who can be raised up if they already don't have or recognize the skill sets, we can work to create those and uncover them and share them in ways that we can work together in harmony to do that. Um, and that administration, I have to admit, I'm a bit of an admin wog. I love it. And I'm a meetings person. I, I do not get drained by meetings. I, I really get fired up by them because people give me ideas. And then I 
absolutely receive them and take them in and use them. And I think when we gather together, whether it's around a board table, around the altar, around a kitchen table or the coffee table, when we share stories or we share, share concerns, we open up the possibility that other people then can share theirs and we can come from diverse places and begin to pool our resources. So I think it'll, it would be a very different thing than I do as a parish priest, but I think I, the, the fun I'm having as an archdeacon is really helping me um, engage in that. And it, if I get the opportunity to do this, I think I'll have a great deal of fun with folks. All right, thank you. Thank you both. And um, I guess, it, you know, we probably all heard and noticed that you both mentioned uh, the reality of dealing with conflict, interpersonal um, friction. And as we know from all of our uh, ministries, that that does uh, tend to be one of the things that bishops address or have to address. Um, and so maybe we'll just, just give you a chance both um, Rachel first and then Chad to elaborate a little bit on, I mean, you both spoke a little bit, but is there anything else that you want to elaborate on how you deal with conflict, maybe a story in your own ministry um, about dealing with conflict um, in, in your own experience? How do you approach the reality of conflict in our communities? Um starting with a story, a story, it wasn't mine. It was my dad's. My dad was a hockey coach for years and I followed him around and um, was part of the team. And one of the, one of the sort of house rules he had was if anybody, if any parent had an issue with a, with a game or something that happened, they had to wait 24 hours. And then he would sit down and have coffee and they could talk about what happened because he didn't want people himself included to react. He wanted to be able to respond. And I have taken that on board. And over the years, I have to admit, as a young priest, I was not very good at re responding. I was pretty quick to react, but age has helped. And I have settled into realizing that more can happen when we take the time to listen and pay attention and ask questions about why are we, why are we experiencing conflict? What's happening? Where are the passions? Where are the disconnects? What is it we're not understanding about what the other person is saying or experiencing than when we have a conflict arise? And as I said earlier, I don't think necessarily that conflict is a bad thing. I think conflict is like the crucible where we begin to learn and we, we discover things we didn't know before. So for me, it's very much about responding. So listening to all sides and then being able to take time to pray, um, to, to maybe go away for a little bit and, and, hear, and ponder what we've heard um, and what we've said, but also time to come together um, and have a facilitated conversation about what it is that we're, we're struggling with and what our hopes are at the end of the struggle. If the ideal could happen, what would that be? And how do we get from point A to point B? How do we get there? But really that whole idea of listening and, and allowing people to know that they have been heard, which often de-escalates a conflict in itself, that someone doesn't feel the need that they need to present their plan or their idea um, and feeling like they're not being listened to, but really listen to everybody who's been involved and to then allow people the opportunity to pray, to ponder, and then come back and respond um, using scripture, using other examples, talking like this to discover how is it that we can find a way to walk the path together, even when we find ourselves appearing to walking on different paths. How do we, how do we join those paths? How do we learn to, to, to decrease the distance between us when we recognize that we probably are working toward the same goal we just have different ways of understanding how we're getting there. So very much listening, conversation, um, being gentle and being calm, um, take counting to 10 or taking 24 hours if need be, but really just being in relationship, being willing to collaborate and to pray and to work on being in relationship with one another, recognizing that not all conflict will be settled to everyone's liking, but how can we find the best way forward for the most people? I think that's sort of in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, and Chad. When it comes to conflict, and I already said relationship is key, um, but very close second, the ego must go. Um, ego is such a hindrance to peace and right relationship 
um, which of course flows out of Micah 6, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly uh, with God. Um, but, but also uh, my model for conflict is um, the gospel model. Um, go directly to the person, bring in others, and then bring in more and discern through that model. Um, and the church reflects that in many ways in our structures and our governance. Um, and one thing that I would lean on as bishop uh, would be a bishop's advisory committee, bring in folks from all walks in the diocese externally too, you know, those not involved in the diocese and have that sounding board. Um, but one story uh, is from Frida. Uh, chokes me a little bit, actually. She shared it at our last executive where she had the experience, Frida Lapine, um, of being at Sacred Circle and there was some conflict arise and someone from the group called for the reading of the gospel in the midst of that conflict. And to me, that is walking humbly with God and with each other. Um, and it healed the division it, or started to. And so that is just such a beautiful example of our approach. And again, the tools we have in our treasure chest as the Diocese of Brandon, as Anglicans, as Christians, as brothers and sisters, north and south, east and west. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who probably, you might know this, um, the practice of gospel-based discipleship always allows us to stop anything we're doing and read the gospel of the day again in any context. And so this is, uh, this is what uh, Chad was referring to. Uh, before we move on to a next question, I just want to remind the attendees, again, if you have questions that are kind of popping up in your heart or your mind, you can be sending those in the Q&A box to, um, and, and Father Chris Evitz is going to be looking at those questions. So you don't have to wait till the end. If there's something on your heart or mind right now and you want to get it into the chat, uh, into the Q&A, you can do that now um, and, and, and throughout our time together this evening. So let's think a little bit about that future um, and the realities of our own community in the Diocese of Brandon. And so starting with um, Chad and then moving to Rachel, give us a little bit, um, an insight into your vision for the Diocese of Brandon as we walk together into the future. Uh, I have to start with a bit of a confession. Um, this took some convincing, major convincing, um, to let my name stand for this. But once I set aside my ego and my own desires and ambitions and all of that, it was startling to me how quickly a very clear vision came um, for the diocese. Um, knowing it as I do, being a child of the diocese, um, and it's quite simple, which also reminds me that it's from God. Um, restoration. Uh, I know that is a frightening prospect because we're tired and we're few, we feel few on the ground and we've had parishes closing and some on the verge and we're unsure about amalgamations and ecumenical shared ministries and we're just, we're tired. And so the thought of a restoration project is like, are you kidding? <laughs> Are you totally out of touch with the diocese? Um, but it really is rooted in um, my belief that we absolutely have what it takes here in the Diocese of Brandon to not only step boldly into the future, um, but to do so in a way that has others sitting up and going, oh, wait a minute, they've got something there. Um, because of who we are and how we approach our common life together. Um, and so I know I already mentioned Johnny Cash. Clearly I'm a music lover, um, but uh, there's a song by um, Ricky Skaggs and Emily Lou Harris 
um, green pastures. It's um, bluegrass. And there's a line, those who strayed were sought by the master. He who once gave his life for the sheep, still he is searching, bringing them in forever to keep where we shall live and die no more. And if music or the dominant culture is doing a better job of conveying our own message, um, we've got some work to do. And so a part of that restoration is looking at our education. Um, the licentiate program through Huron, big step. Absolutely. Thank God Bishop Cliff uh, implemented that. Um, but we need to take that further and grassroots as well. And so to have alpha in every parish, not necessarily every church, but every parish grouping, um, stewardship course called to be the church offered um, by the United Church of Canada is phenomenal. It has changed things fundamentally in this parish that I'm serving in. Um, blanket and mapping exercises regionally um, Rachel, you'll remember mission schools in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, um, relearning mission, uh, all of these as building blocks, um, as well as taking hold of treasure that is Indigenous culture and a part of our diocese in trusting our creator that we will be provided for and freed, perfect freedom that the prayer book speaks of, um, to step into an exciting restoration project we're not too tired we're not too old thank you thank you very much chad um and again to you rachel um tell us a little bit about your vision for the diocese of brandon okay i have to admit i know i'm not supposed to be jealous but i am jealous because i don't have the is on the feet on the ground knowledge of the of the diocese the way, the way you all do and the way Chad does, but I think the benefit of that for me is the opportunity to see with new eyes and to be able to hear with new ears what people are saying and, and how they are feeling the love that they have for Christ and the place where they live, which is such an important thing, is to recognize your environment as well as who you're called to be and how God, when God has put you there, then there's a purpose for that. Um, one of the, the pieces of work I did in Huron and I loved so much was a program called Fresh Start. Uh, where any church that was going into transition or any priest who was going into transition, meaning leaving a parish or going into a new one, had to go and do this program. And I was blessed to be able to participate as a priest, as a participant, but also to do the, the training and do the Fresh Start uh, facilitation for congregations. And the whole premise was that when we hear that someone is leaving, in this case, a bishop has left the place, this diocese, that we all go into a brand new place. Um, and it's un uncomfortable and it can be very exciting because we don't know where God is calling us to next. We don't know who God is calling to walk with us next or who we will be when that person joins us. And so a vision, thinking of vision for the diocese, um, it, it, it's already begun in the work that you're doing in, in letting Chad and I discern with you about the future of, of the diocese. But it's work that, that begins when Jesus meets us where we're at. And the idea that, that you have already begun with the licentiate, the work being done at the college, all of these ways of, of non-traditional in Anglican church world, uh, ways of raising up people of all levels, whether it's from baptism through ordination, to, to seek and serve, not just to seek and serve Christ in the world, but actually specifically to seek and serve Christ in your local locations is absolutely phenomenal. But the other thing that Fresh Start taught me is that sometimes the things that we have always counted on as being there, it's okay when they disappear. We learn, like Peter, that when we when Jesus calls us to step out of the boat, we have to trust that we're going to be okay. When we think on ourselves, we start to sink. When we think on Jesus, we are raised back up. And the Diocese of Brandon is at a brand new place. It's at a crossroads. And I, from everything I read in the profile, from what I've seen and what I'm hearing, especially what Chad is saying this evening, I, there is a great deal of hope and there is a great deal of the, the, the harvest is ready for it. It's ready to be, to be harvested. You are ready to take that next step in who you're called by God to become. And I know having had to close a church um, in London, how difficult it is to say goodbye to the way things have been. 
But that congregation also taught me the great power and joy there is in saying, we're unsure of where God is calling us to go, but this is an exciting place to be. So I got the hand from Chris. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, this, this time um, and seeking what a vision might be, I, I can't honestly know what God is calling us to do until I get on the ground with you. But I'll tell you, I look forward to it if I get the chance. And if, if I don't, you can count on me to be praying for Chad and all of you as you move forward and looking to see you doing your thing on the national stage as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll do one more question for you both, and then we'll take a short break, uh, just a little stretch. And uh, you can, I don't know, exercise your smiling muscles or uh, whatever the case may be. <laughs> so um, obviously, uh, our, our diocese has a very uh, particular character with regard to the integration and the partnership between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities in our diocese. This is a long-standing partnership, of course, because we are people of this land. And so the next question really is about, um, if you can, uh, first Rachel and, and then Chad, if you can please uh, describe your own experience with and involvement with Indigenous communities in your uh, ministries at, to, up to this point. Okay, thank you, Kara. Um, to be quite frank, I don't have a great deal of experience. Where I've lived, um, we didn't have um, Indigenous populations readily handy for us until I moved to the Diocese of Edmonton. Now, where I live is, is quite a piece from any of our Indigenous populations. But being in this diocese has allowed me the incredible gift of being able to work beside Archdeacon Travis Enright, who is um, the Archdeacon for Indigenous Ministries and Decolonization. And the work that our diocese right now is in intentionally taking to work on reparations, to work on um, truth and healing and reconciliation. And involved in that has been the, the, the great um, opportunity for me to, to sit with uh, an elder and participate in the seven Cree teachings, which have only just scratched the surface for me, have helped me to realize how much I have to learn, but also how, how deep the, the desire is in me to participate and to learn and to watch and listen and to be taught a new way. Um, I really, it's getting older, but I think I'm really beginning to appreciate the vastness of what I do not know and the importance of all of those things that others and elders have to teach us if we have a heart willing to be open to listening. Um, being here, I, I've taken a course through the U of A on in, um, Indigenous peoples and I have been invited to go to Frog Lake First Nation the last two years um, to celebrate uh, Eucharist and the Standing Stones tradition and getting to know the people and, and just being welcomed so beautifully into their, into their community. I have not um, had experience with Council of the Churches or uh, Councils of the North, sorry, or um, Sacred Circle and things like that, but I have a deep desire to learn. Um, and, and just for clarity, like for being open, um, I have an adopted sister. She is nine years younger than me um, and she is um, indigenous and was raised knowing that she was, but was raised in a white family. Um, and that has was always since I was nine years old has been an important thing for me to, to pay attention to and to learn more about. Um, and I am only now um, this late in life coming to understand just the, the absolute integrity and the importance of, of recognizing that one way is not the way, that there are so many different ways of experiencing creator, of experiencing teaching and sharing ministry and learning from one another. Um, that, that should I be invited to come to Brandon, um, my learning curve will be vertical and I'm so okay with that. Um, but it would be, for one, it is, it is with absolute, with, without a doubt, one of the very things that really makes the Diocese of Brandon feel like it would be an exciting and beautiful place for me to continue ministry. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead, uh, Chad, same, same question to you. Thanks, Rachel. If it is God's will that you are next Bishop, look forward to getting to know our indigenous folks. Um, when things get intense at executive, I sidle up to like, 
Frida or Flora or Gloria or somebody, um, again, because of that spirit they carry, that joy, um, laugh through the tenseness and, you know, um, smile through it. And there is a hospitality and there is a warmth um, amidst uh, great adversity. Um, and so that is very much a part of our diocesan family life. Uh, personally, um, in every parish I've served, I've made a point of connecting with elders in the nearest First Nation um, because I grew up uh, with um, Indigenous neighbors. Uh, we farmed land by Kisikawainan First Nation and um, shared equipment and helped fix each other's stuff and gave rides to each other from field to field. And so I knew growing up of that culture and the warmth um, and joy therein. Um, interesting story from Sioux Valley. There's lots of Pratt's at Sioux Valley. Um, that's actually uh, a family name on my dad's side, um, which some of the Sioux when feel, fleeing the uh, Indian Wars in uh, the U.S. Dakotas in the late 1800s, um, my family sheltered them, the Pratt's, and they took their name with them to Canada. Um, so we've always maintained that connection. Um, during COVID, we partnered with Sandy Bay First Nation, which is near Tanipawa here in the COVID response team uh, through the parish. Um, in Nova Scotia, um, Acadia First Nation, the particularly Gold River, um, we were invited as the nearest Anglican parish um, to sit with their elders around sacred fire and learn uh, the sacred teachings. Um, and so one of my favorite experiences of indigenous culture revolves around mosquitoes, which we got them here, <laughs> right folks? Um, but we learned from uh, an elder uh, at camp, actually. We had invited um, an elder to camp here in the diocese and he shared with us that the the white powder on the poplars not only is a sunscreen but a mosquito repellent and to me that is just an example of a bridge between cultures like we all need that <laughs> here and then that's just a beautiful example of it um as i said earlier i've participated in uh, mapping the ground we stand on exercises and blanket exercises helping to facilitate both in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. Um, it's, it's extensive, in part because I've grown up here. And it's just a beautiful culture to walk alongside. All right. Thank you both for that. And we might explore some of those ideas yet in our question and answer. But for now, let's just take um, a two minute break. Right. Uh, stretch a little, get get some water and um, we'll give we'll give our uh, candidates a chance to, you know, roll their necks or I mean, I'm not going to lead you in calisthenics, but here we'll take a, a couple of minutes um, and then we'll come back like literally just two minutes. Um, but we'll come back and, and continue on in our gathering. I should have had Chris timing um, so because I was waiting for the raised hand, but psh, it wasn't there. But in those couple of minutes, we fixed the um, volume on the on the college. So the folks that are there, there's a four people over there. They can actually hear properly rather than the blasting speaker from my office. So welcome back to you all. Um, and so I have one more uh, question that the search committee prepared before we move on to, um, I, I we kind of turn it over to Father Chris to ask some of the questions that are in the Q&A. And again, remember folks that you can ask some questions. And I have backup questions. If there aren't any, don't worry, we'll go to 830 in case that was a concern of yours. So um, my final question, and we'll get we'll we'll start with you, Chad, and uh, then move to Rachel after that is um, is about yourselves. And if you could give us um, a little sense of your own network of support and care. What what kind of um, network do you have that supports you and cares for you and what the things that you need? 
thank you. Um, sometimes you have to go away to realize what you have. And when we did that, went to Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, um, realized both Don and I come from big families. Like we have to rent halls when we get together <laughs> on both sides. Um, we just realized that we are very tribal that way. We can't live far away from our people because of how they support us. Um, and to do without that was a challenge. Now, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Rachel, you know, they just look after you and they are so hospitable and they did and they loved us like their own. Um, but we have a very strong network um, here um, of family and friends. Um, so that's a big piece to the support and care uh, that we receive. And I say we because Don has always been very much um, a part of this ministry and my greatest support. Um, that's the coffee piece in the morning with her. Lots of things get hashed out. Um, I've learned to say no. That's a tough one. Um, but it is something I'm refining. And that is a measure of support and care for myself. I recognize my boundaries. And part of that comes with, you know, age. Turned 40 this year. Married for 20 years. You learn these things. Um, so that's a piece of it. Um, I'm also a Benedictine. Uh, and so that in itself is a spiritual network of support. We have communities in Victoria, Vancouver, Edmonton, Arizona, um, North, uh, South Dakota, and we meet every week by Zoom um, uh, to support one another and to delve into spiritual matters and discernment and um, questioning of scripture. And that is just such a support uh, for me. Sacred fire. Again, something I've learned from the elders I've spent time with, uh, that is such a healing space, whether it's in our hearth at home or bonfire outside, um, that is a, um, a nourishment and, and sort of a, a healing space for me. Um, crop thorn, oh, Rachel, you'll love crop thorn. <laughs> uh, clergy cottage up in our national park in a spectacular place um, that is one of the supports that I draw on. I take um, regular uh, advantage of holiday time. Um, I never leave any on the table. I used to in my early ministry, not anymore. We need that. That's a gift. Um, annual retreat. I take advantage of the sabbatical times offered to us. And when things are really getting rough, I get outside, hike, I spend time um on trails in canoes and around cows. I'm just gonna leave that there. All right, <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Chad. Um, what about you, Rachel? Tell us a little bit about your network of support and care. Well, the first and foremost for me is my husband. Um, he is, uh, he's, he's a strong personality and he reminds me on a regular basis that, that just because you're strong doesn't mean you can't be weak sometimes. And he, he, he gives me lots of opportunities to say like he iron sharpens iron he challenges me, but at the same time, he knows me well enough to say, okay, step back, think about this, um, take some time. Um, one of the gifts though, that I learned, cause we, we met later in life is that I am, I, I, I'm okay on my own and being married to a military person that works, he's been deployed so often and gone for courses and things like that, that I've found that with the rhythm of, of his, his being away, i quickly realized I needed to find a comfort level in peace by myself. So finding that, that quiet time in the house and finding going for walks or going for drives and finding that John just to settle and to be, and to listen for God's voice. I am. Um, and I'm um, quite a bit of time every morning um, meditating and praying and listening and reading scripture and reading other things. And I, I find on those days when I, kind of sleep in or something's happening and I have to be on the road at 6 30 that you know maybe that doesn't get done and my whole day is like this <laughs> like it's just I need that so um learning that there are different ways of praying even if you're on the road or if you haven't got your own 
you know, chair to sit in. Um, retreat time has always been important to me. Um, holiday time, like Chad, he was, it was difficult earlier in the, in life to take all my holiday time. And now it's more, it's, it's not as difficult because whenever we take holiday time it's to go back to Ontario. So <laughs> we do a lot of driving and, and I find that to be very peaceful. Um, because of Zoom and, and well, COVID started it, because, but because of the electronics, we now have also uh, developed this great ability to reach out to family. Uh, my family is not large um, and neither was Rob's, but we have the ability to reach out and I can still see my nieces and nephews and what they're doing. But I'm from that distance where I'm not, you know, getting in, getting mixed into the weeds of telling my sisters, younger sisters, how to do it better. Um we, so I have, as I said, I've had the two stepsons and they're in Ontario with their mom and being able to reach out to them via a medium like this is excellent because it allows us to stay in touch, uh, but not for me not to be a hovering stepmom. Um, but also um, the, this medium has been fantastic for me because of COVID, we created um, a, a, a daily video um, that I do. And we have created this community online that has been fantastic, including going east this this summer to see family and being able to stop in a few places in the States and meet with people that I'd only ever been able to talk to online and getting to realize the impact that they have on me. It's it's a virtual sort of, it's a, you know, it's an online community, but they are a part of my life every day. And they, they balance me and they challenge me and they remind me to pray and they remind me not to take myself too seriously. So the prayer, um, silent times, being alone sometimes, but that's my, that's my sort of go-to. It's worked well for years. I don't see it changing too much in the future. I've got the hand. So here I go. <laughs> poor, poor Chris is going to be known as the one who just stops everything but don't worry because we're going to switch over now um and chris is going to ask and give voice to some of the questions that have been given to him either through the q a or privately through message and maybe chris to relieve you from doing the timing i'll do the hand this time so you don't have to um so i'm gonna turn it over to you the reverend chris evans Well, good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, good to see you uh, both, Rachel and Chad. Uh, we have a number of questions from the community. Uh, um, and uh, I'll just start in no particular order, just, uh, but we'll start with Chad as, uh, did Chad, did you start last time? Sorry. I don't okay. recall. We'll start with Chad nonetheless. The first question is, Within your walk with the creator, how do you see the medicine wheel relating to scriptural teaching? Hmm. Great question. Um, the medicine wheel, four directions, um, is a beautiful symbol for how um, differences can be brought together in one. And so that circular piece um, with the four pieces um, representing the the four directions and all that they represent, um, to me is interwoven in scripture because scripture is cyclical, right? It, it's, it, it imitates the medicine wheel. And so again, this is an example of indigenous teaching um, opening up um, a view to scripture. And so then you get that interconnectivity of, you know, two cultures um, and opening our hearts to being able to receive from one another those gifts um, and to read scripture in that cyclical fashion, um, which is very different than, um, you know, a fundamental literal reading of scripture, which we know is problematic. Um, or trying to read all of the books in the Bible the same way. Um, the Indigenous approach to that with the example of the medicine wheel um, is just far more organic and a much healthier way to read sacred scripture. Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. 
It is a great question. And I admit I am completely flat footed because I have zero experience with the medicine wheel. But um, just picking up on what, what Chad was saying, um, the understanding of scripture and, and how we interpret and how we interact with scripture in all of life. To me, I think, I think of the seasons of life and the recognition that Every season brings with it something new, a different perspective, a different, a different place. Um, in seasons in life, we have the opportunity to, to grow and we have the opportunity to continue to grow, to plant, to then to, be, to, to come into a time of, of quiet. And, and each of those times in life for me um, has been an opportunity to reread and, and relook at the scripture from a completely different perspective. And, and, and like anything else we learn, we layer our learning. There's, you don't learn a new thing and throw out what you've known. It, it, it weaves itself together with what we have experienced and what we've known before. And so for me, um, not knowing what I'm talking about with the medicine wheel, but an absolute desire to learn that, I think that, that will be in addition to something that will add into and, and create a whole new um, depth of knowledge and understanding and experiencing the scripture in my life and in the way that I interact with people um, in their walk and their journey with Christ as well. Thank you very much. Uh, another question. Uh, we'll start with Rachel as it's addressed to Rachel, but it's uh, Chad, you're very welcome to answer this as well. Rachel, if you had a chance to go to a reserve and sit down with an uh, Indigenous elder to ask any question about Indigenous communities, what would you want to learn more about? Oh, one question. I think I, I, I think what I would really want to ask is what do you believe is the most important thing I need to know about your community? Being able to, to recognize that people will share with me what is the most important thing on their heart. And that speaks volumes about their own life, their community, their experiences, their communal experiences. I, I recognize that I, I come into any community, whether it's an indigenous community or any other community in any place I've never been, uh, completely without knowledge. And, and that means I need to be the sponge. I need to be the one who sits and listens and asks questions and recognizes when maybe the question I've asked is not the right question, but then be able to say, okay, what might be the right question? How, what, what is it you would like me to know? I, I recognize that I have, I have so much to learn. Um, as, as still as a priest, I would certainly have volumes to learn as a bishop. But as, as a, a fellow Christian, as a fellow traveler on the road, learning from someone um, who is coming from a completely different culture, I am, I am walking in, I don't know the language, I don't know the, the context, I don't know any of these things. And so my hope would be that I would, I would sit down and ask, what do you need me to know? What, what do I need to know to begin to enter into the community or to be received by the community at your own pace? what are the important things of who you are and what are the stories that you like to tell the most? Um, I've often found that when people tell their stories, they don't always make sense to me in the moment about how they're told, but in retrospect, it speaks volumes about who they are in the order that they tell the story or the emphasis they put on certain things. And I would simply want to ask people that to be patient with me and, and to tell me their story, the story of themselves, their community, and help me to understand what their walk is um, and where they're coming from and what they what they are doing and who who God is what God is doing in and through them. Um, I first I, I don't know anything, so tell me what you want me to know. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, we'll switch over to Chad. Thanks, Chris. Um, first of all. Um, sitting down with elders on a reserve, I would expect it to be over bannock burgers uh, or <laughs> a fry bread of some sort. Thank you. Um, amazing. Uh, secondly, this is this is going to go into the very personal, and I'm actually hesitating to share this, but spirit is speaking to me. Um, 
have this vision for our diocese. We are like geographically situated at the heart of the country, but also we are at the heart of reconciliation in part because we are in relationship with each other um, first and foremost and have been for a long time. Um, not saying that relationship has always been right, but been in relationship. And so as um, sort of a center for reconciliation, I have this vision. I don't know if you'll be familiar with um, the Catholic practice of when a cardinal dies, they lift the red cardinal's hat uh, up into the rafters of his cathedral. Um, and it stays there until it disintegrates. And I have this vision of our cathedral and having a red dress raised in its rafters um, for missing and murdered Indigenous women and two-spirit uh, people um, to just show like we are committed to this in a real way um, as an Anglican family. And then as a part of that, um, Again, I don't know if you're familiar with this reference, but in Westminster Abbey, as you enter the Great West Doors, there is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier right in the middle of the aisle. Like You have to walk around it. The, the sovereign has to process around it. It's that important. I see us creating in our cathedral uh, something similar for a memorial for residential school um, victims and survivors. Um, middle of the aisle like you can't miss it and so my question in sitting down with elders on a reserve would be okay i've received this image it's clearly from god it's not my own doing trust me i couldn't come up with this on my own um, but how does that sit with you how does that resonate does that respond to the hurts um that have been perpetrated um is this something that would be helpful in our healing journey? Would you be a part of this? Thank you, Chad. Uh, while I have you, Chad, uh, we're going to start with you for the next question. Uh, as a bishop, it will be your role to empower all believers to participate in the life of the church. And we are wondering how does baptism play into that life? Foundationally. <clears throat> um, our baptismal covenant, as laid out in our baptismal liturgy in the Book of Alternative Services anyways, and that's the one utilized the most, um, there's a framework there for the entirety of our life. Um, as human beings, but as baptized Christians. And in that, there is woven a structure of care um, for our faith, for uh, ourselves, for um, our neighbor, for creation. Um, and that expression of care flows, unintended, from the font. Um, Bishop William, a couple of years ago, I don't know how it was communicated in a letter or, or something, he said, uh, our fonts need to be full. We need to have water in our fonts because we're baptizing or blessing. Um, and that image has stuck with me. And that is a response um, from us to the world. And for too long, we have put up roadblocks. Well, we can't baptize your baby because you're divorced or you're not married or, you know, whatever. Um, to just take the way of love, fill our fonts, baptize. We just had five baptisms at St. Paul's Shoal Lake a couple weeks ago in a parish that is discerning closure. I mean, hello, the Holy Spirit is working there and baptism is the pivot point uh, for that. And through through that flows um, our model uh, for, for leadership and for raising up leaders around us. And as bishop, um, that would be the source um, to quench 
uh, sorry, full of puns, um, but it's just so rich with imagery. Um, and that outward invisible sign of the inward and invisible graces that we receive is a powerful one. And we just can't lose sight of it. And Rachel, how how does uh, baptism play into that life for you? I'm going to start by talking about another another sacrament, sacrament of ordination. When I was first um, about to be ordained a deacon, the day before, um, I was panicking and not sure if this was something I should be doing. And so I went and visited a priest in the Diocese of Huron, and he sat me down and he gave me the best wisdom anyone's ever given me. And I want to take it a step further. He told me that the moment I was ordained a deacon would be the highest I would be on the ladder of my vocation. The most important thing you can do is to serve. And that is what a deacon does. And I would like to suggest that we need to go take that one step further. I think in, in the 24 years of baptizing um, infants and adults and everybody in between, that really that the highest we will ever be, the highest, the closest we will ever be to truly being able to serve in the capacity we are called to serve is when we are baptized. That is that moment when we are, we are acknowledging and being acknowledged as fully members of the body of Christ as the kingdom of children in the kingdom of God. It is that moment when we get our marching orders to tell us, this is what you're called to do. This is what your whole world, everything you do, whether you're six years old or you're 60, these are the things, if anybody at any time says to you, why are you doing this? You say, because I serve Jesus Christ and this is how I do it. But also, these are the things we can fall back on. But also within the baptism is the response that we will with God's help. And we say it together as a community. We don't do it privately. We do this as a congregation, as a community that comes together and says, we know we can't do this by ourselves, but together and with God's help, we can. And each of our vow, each of our baptismal promises, they lead us further into community. They lead us closer to one another. And when we can, when we can live that way, when we can live as a community of baptized people, we can deal with conflict and we can deal with change. We can deal with churches being closed or churches being reborn, rebirthed into a new incarnation. It may not have a building, but it always has a community. And I think if we, if we, if we look at baptism, as, as Chad said, as, as a foundational, as absolutely the core upon which we build our ministries, both as individuals, but as communities, will be in awesome shape. I think baptisms are an opportunity for us to come together to show absolute incarnate love for God, for Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and for one another. And there is nothing as uplifting in my life and ministry as those moments when someone comes to me and says, I would like to be baptized or a family comes and says, you know, here I am. And I have, I have yet to say to someone, you can't be baptized. The promises they make are promises they make to God, not to me as their priest. And I believe the Holy Spirit works in ways that we cannot ask or imagine. There are things that happen in a, child, in a person's life when they are baptized that we will never be able to imagine, but are beautiful when they are unfolding. Thank you very much. Uh, baptism is very near and dear to my heart as well. Uh, so uh, it looks like we only have time for about maybe two more questions. So I apologize to all the people in the Q&A. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all the questions. And so um, this time uh, I'll start with Rachel. It says, in a dream, God tells you that you will be the next bishop of the Brandon Diocese. For support, God will allow you to choose one person from the Old Testament and one person from the New Testament, in addition to Jesus, for your support staff. Who would you choose and why? What a brilliant question. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Ezekiel. From Old Testament Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel, the Valley of Dry Bones has been my my go to forever. Um, just a reminder that we that we might begin thinking that we don't have what we need, but if we if we move in tandem with what the Holy Spirit is calling us to do, 
and, and looking toward what Christ is asking of us, then we find we have that next set of the next sinews, the skin, the breath, we have what we need. So absolutely Ezekiel. And I think Mary Magdalene um, in her many ways of being presented and understood, I, I think often of her, especially at Easter, about being that first person who was faithful enough to be there at the tomb and say, you know, looking at the guard, which who she thought was the gardener and saying, where have you taken him? I'll go and do whatever I have to do. And when he says her name, then she recognizes him because I, I pray every day that I will, I will recognize Christ's voice when he says my name, that I will have that wisdom. So to have the one who reminds us that we will have in good time and in good faith, what God needs us to have. And then to have that one helping me beside me, always reminding me that I just need to listen, listen with an open heart to hear my name being called. I think Ezekiel and Mary Magdalene would be my, my uh, support staff. That's, that's, a, that's a great question. Thank you. And, and Chad, how about you? Who's, uh, who are you going to call for backup? Jeremiah, uh, because of his humility, he knows his faults, he recognizes them. I'm too young. I, I don't have what it takes. I can't speak eloquently. Um, nope, God, you don't want me. So partially because I really um, um, connect with him. Um, but the humility piece there, but also his ability to step past those insecurities and you know everything that holds him back and serve God fully. Um, New Testament, Mary Magdalene. See, Rachel and I are friends. <laughs> we keep telling you that. Um, in part, um, because in you know your typical Last Supper image, she's next to Jesus. And that's the longing of my heart. I just want to be near him in all that I do, all that I say, Every every sermon that I preach, my prayer on my knees in my office or the vestry before is in my heart and upon my lips that I may speak your truth. That's it. That's all I want to do, Jesus. Um, and share with the world that image of the shepherd who seeks, who chases after us, no matter how far we run. And I just see Mary Magdalene as that... Um, you know, right beside Jesus figure through it all. Um, they'd make amazing stuff. That is the best question. I love it. Thank you both very much. Now for the very last question, uh, we're going to deviate a little bit from the plan. Uh, there is um, some specific questions in the Q&A. One is for Rachel, one is for Chad. And so uh, we're going to ask Rachel her question, and then we're going to ask Chad his question. So Rachel, the question for Rachel, it says, your two vlogs on YouTube have quite the followings. How did they start? And what is the highlight of this far reaching ministry for you? Okay, um, they started when the Diocese of Edmonton announced that we were going to be closing our churches for COVID um, for the second time. And I wasn't here for the first round and came in and realized uh, that on the Thursday when we were gonna be doing church online on Sunday, that I had no idea how to use the technology and I didn't even know where to look into a camera. So I started out just doing sort of a, a, that. And then after the first week realizing we were only supposed to be closed for two weeks and it ended up being many months. Um, I started doing that as a way of being able to connect with parishioners because I started working in the parish on the 15th of September and we closed down around the 19th of November. So I hadn't had a chance to meet many people in person yet. Um, and so this was a way that I could connect with parishioners on a regular, on a regular basis and sort of figure out what to do for Sundays. And then it just became um, when, when COVID we were able to reopen um, and I sort of suggested that maybe we would we wouldn't do this anymore. People said no, no, no. And I I realized we had a lot of our seniors and people who were in um, seniors' homes that were watching, and other people a bit further afield, people from other places I have lived and people that I've never met. Um, and that's sort of um, how that happened. And um, it, it is it's it's an incredible gift 
to me, the, uh, the ability for to do this. And as I said earlier, people have been, they ask me questions. Some of the topics I talk about are because people have actually said, can you address this? Um, and some of the most powerful things have been people challenging me in things that I have thought were, were steadfast, you know, things I've, I didn't really question much. And people would come back and say, how could you say that? Or what do you mean by that? And it, because it makes me think, it makes me pray. And so a very powerful part for me has been in the growth and spiritual learning and even figuring out those things that, no, you know, that's what I do believe. And this is why I've got, I've got my, um, my feet planted firmly, I believe where God wants them to be. And I'm not going to waver on this, but um, I'm sorry, Chris, I forgot the second part of the question, but <laughs> there you go. That's where it all came from. No, no problem. Thank you very much. Uh, and the last question uh, for Chad, uh, as you had already indicated, you are a, a son of this diocese. How do you see the dynamics of going from being colleagues with the other clergy to being their shepherd? Great question. Something I've prayed a, minute, a lot about, still praying about. Again, recognizing that um, this is not my doing. This is not something I've chased after. And in many ways, I'd be the first, like Jeremiah, to be like, mm. <laughs> uh, you know, too many shortcomings here. But in submitting to this and relinquishing my own will, my own selfish desires, to just continue driving school bus and tending my parish here in Nipawa and setting all that aside. Um, there is a recognition that if God is calling me to this, he will facilitate those relationships uh, in a new way. Um, but I want to be more specific than that. Um, first of all, the foundation from which we would be building is love. Love doesn't mean that we've always agreed or we always get along um, or that we're even always friends. But we are in a loving relationship with one another as colleagues in ministry in Christ. And from that foundation, we can build anything. Um, you know my warts. You know my scars. You know my shortcomings. And so it would require of you that leap of faith as well, uh, like in any relationship, it's give and take. Um, but specifically, know that I would be coming to this um, with humility. As a Benedictine, that is absolutely at the core of who I am. And in that humility, there is an innate trust in God um, to facilitate our relationship new, be it God's will, um, and that my framework for the episcopacy is servant leadership, the shepherd. Um, the shepherd goes before the flock and sacrifices and makes sure it's safe and that there's good water and good pasture. And, and um, Jesus says uh, for a shepherding relationship to work, there has to be a knowledge of one another there. Um, and so I trust in that, um, that God will follow through on that. Um, but one example of a way we would begin to reform and reshape our relationships with one another would be on retreat, to spend time in the wilderness together. That is crucial. Um, and for various reasons, it's something we haven't done enough of in the diocese, COVID in particular. Um, but that is a huge bridge builder. Um, and then I would offer, lastly, I see your hand, Kara, thank you, um, the example of locally raised clergy. Uh, more prominent the last few years because of um, the situation we're in, rurally, uh, demographically. Um, we have the ability as people of faith, as Anglicans, um, to lift people up from our midst, grassroots, who were in the pew beside us, but then we're calling them to be lay readers or chair of you know parish council or deacons or priests or bishops. Um, we have that in us. And again, the foundation of that is love and trust in God. And 
um, we live it out already. Thank you. Oh, thank you both. And thanks to um, Chris for navigating the chat. Um, just, I'm not entirely certain if you're, you're all aware, but we do have um, 31 participants in this particular webinar. And I know that out of those 31 participants, there might be um, watch parties. I know here in the college, we have four people in the classroom and other places are having kind of watch parties as well. So I imagine that we have more joining that have joined us for this really good time of learning and listening and sharing. And um, well, anyone who takes a class with me knows that I'm always ready just to keep going. And I know that that's not everyone. Everyone doesn't always want to just keep going like I do, because I love getting together, talking about the work of Jesus in our midst and how the Holy Spirit unites us, brings us together, helps us hear one another, discern the will of God, and then just go for it to do it. And so um, Rachel and Chad, thank you for giving us a picture of what that um, looks like in your own ministries and what that might look like in the future for our diocese. Thanks to also all of the attendees ha who have taken time out of their uh, days to join us and to maybe go to a watch party, to ask really insightful questions. And of course, I'm, I do apologize, we couldn't get to them all, um, but thank you for asking your questions and to think about, um, and to really actually put your heart into this whole process. We truly believe, like I truly believe, um, asking the Holy Spirit's guidance is not lip service. It's not just like the thing we just, they say, and then we just go do what we want to do. Um, we do believe in the spirit guiding us. We do believe in Christ with us. And so this is all part of that general process for you, synod delegates, um, both for our diocesan synod and of course for our electoral synod, you'll continue to get information from Father Matt, the secretary of synod. And so keep your eyes on your um, inboxes for that. I think, um, again, I just wanna thank both uh, Chad and Rachel for um, sharing their hearts with us. Not easy thing to do. Um, and you can, again, you can massage your um, smiling cheek muscles after we're done here uh, today. Um, but I'm really appreciative that we could all gather together. Thanks to, to, to Chris and to Matt for um, managing, <laughs> helping, helping to manage this uh, town hall. It will just give us, give you us all a picture of what the Diocese of Brandon is all about. And that is working together, learning new skills on the fly and adjusting when needed. So um, all in the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we close our time together, I'm going to say a prayer and then I'm going to invite us all to wherever we are. And I know, you know, we're not going to hear each other, but of course we are united in the spirit that we'll say the Lord's prayer together across, um, across the communities that we are in right now. So let us pray. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence that is with us, that is surrounding us and that draws us together, that unites us. And we continue to ask for your Holy Spirit presence to guide us as we discern and as we hear your voice for the future of our diocese and the future of, of the leadership for our, di our diocese. We thank you that you are always with us, that your promises that you never leave us or forsake us, and you will be with, with us to the end of the age. For that, Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. Creator God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills that we might be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. And then use us, we pray, as you will, always to your glory and the welfare of your people. We pray this through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you all once again for joining us. It's been a joy to be with you. It's been a joy to hear the responses and to think about how the spirit is going to guide us into the future. And so now go with God's blessing. If you're driving um, in a little bit of ice and snow, be safe and we will see you soon together as we gather in Brandon on the 23rd, 24th and 25th for our synods. Blessings be on you. Blessings.